Our last speaker, but clearly not least, is, is Dr. Neil Wenger. Dr. Wenger is a professor of medicine at UCLA, and he's the director of the UCLA Health System Ethics Center, and he's going to be discussing different types of ethical issues that I see, that, that we see in clinical practice. Neil. Thanks so much, Dr. Kwan. Um, um, I'm a primary care doc, and some of those videos made me uh, recognize why I'm a primary care doc. <laughs> um, um, and it's actually apropos that I come after Dr. Tarnay, uh, because many of the issues that he raised are exactly uh, what I would like to tackle today in talking about improving care at the end of life. Um, I think that implicit in his uh, presentation is that much of the primary care um, responsibility and ability to direct our patients to receive appropriate care is to choose the appropriate surgeon with the appropriate experience. Concerning end-of-life care, we are the central players and have the largest amount of power to actually change how care occurs at the end of life. And that's going to be my message uh, here today. If I can figure out how to advance the slides. Maybe it's this. There we go. So the learning objectives uh, are to understand how the compression and morbidity and availability of technically advanced treatment come together to require advanced care planning to provide high quality care for complex patients, to become familiar with models and tools to enhance advanced care planning for appropriate care. And I want to actually spend a little bit of time talking about what is it that you can do to ensure that your patients get appropriate care at the end of life and to recognize situations in which inappropriate treatment and decision-making disagreements are common in order to reduce the likelihood of, of conflict. So we live in an age of medical miracles. In Los Angeles, I can't drive to work without hearing about one medical center that can now cure cancer or do something that I know that clinically is pretty unlikely. Um, however, it's not all miracles, right? We produce, in the United States, more patients in health states that patients tell us that they don't want than any other nation in the world. And it is entirely under our control, usually, whether patients remain permanently in the vegetative state, in a minimally conscious state, and states of incapable of recognizing loved ones, breathing on their own, taking care of themselves. And that leaves us, not only because of the stuff that Dr. Ye and Dr. Uh, Tarnay and others have presented today, um, in the group of nations concerning expenditures versus life expect expectancy so far off the chart that we're not even near the line. So these are all of the industrialized nations and some non-industrialized nations. This is life expectancy. This is cost per capita for health care. And there we are. And much of that care, we now understand, is related to care at the end of life. And this has led those at the Dartmouth uh, Atlas to say that we have now moved past the maximum where we would like to be, where frequency of care, utilization, um, maxes out both life expectancy as well as quality of life, and that we're actually on the downward limb. Take, for instance, this case. This could be a patient of yours that gets referred to, a, um, uh, to an academic medical center. A 60-year-old woman has a massive MI. She's rescued by ECMO and has a left ventricular assist device implanted as a bridge to heart transplant. She does great, is up walking in the halls, talking, actually complaining about her diet, um, and then sustains a large embolic stroke. After two months of observation, neurology diagnoses her as minimally conscious at best. They prognosticate no improvement and no change, and no chance of a return to a functional state. She's no longer a transplant candidate. The care team feels the mechanical support is no longer indicated and should be removed, and they recommend that to the family. 
The patient's family refuses to stop the, le the left ventricular assist device, believing that there's always a chance, and the physicians don't push them. So you, this is a chance for you guys to respond using the audience response system. Uh, what would be the appropriate next step for these physicians? One, maintain the patient on the ventricular assist device, although there's no chance for transplant. Two, stop the LVAD. Uh, or some other life-sustaining treatment contrary to the wishes of the family, override them. Three, petition the court to allow discontinuation of life-sustaining treatment. Or four, some other plan. Please vote. So overwhelmingly, this group would like to go to court. However, 36% of you have another plan. Well, I face this issue, this issue not infrequently, and I would love to know your plan. <laughs> uh, people are yelling hospice. Well, that would have been voting for number two, that you would override the family, right? Very few wanted to override the family. How do we extricate ourselves from ever getting into this situation, or how do we solve it once we're in it? That's what I hope to talk about for the next few minutes. So let's think about why we went to medical school and became physicians. It's largely to achieve one of these goals of the healthcare system. Um, restoration of health, saving of life, restoring and preserving function, relief of symptoms, provision of comfort, that's why I became a doc. I put up there stewarding scarce healthcare resources in italics with a question mark because not everyone would agree to that. However, these are in general why we became docs. Yet many of the cases that we, we are presented with that are difficult from a medical ethics perspective don't fit into these categories. So I get called as an, as an ethics consultant. Um, I get called up to our bone marrow transplant unit, and I see the woman who says, wow, I'm really glad that they called you, because they told me that I have such severe graft-versus-host disease that I'm not going to survive to leave the hospital, and that they're going to move me to the ICU. So I want to be moved to the ICU. I want to be put on the ventilator in two weeks, I want the morphine drip turned up, take me off the vent, let me die peacefully. Because in 10 days, the divorce goes through, the house goes to my daughter, and I die peacefully. So you guys didn't quarrel with any of my goals of, of medicine that we're all striving to achieve, but where is passage of inheritance, right? It's these, it's these economic factors that impinge upon the way that we practice medicine that make medicine sometimes really complicated. So let's take a much easier case. 75-year-old woman, this is something that I would get on the wards on certainly every other day. 75-year-old woman with advanced dementia gets admitted to the hospital from home with an aspiration pneumonia. Because of worsening function, the patient can no longer be cared for at home. The family and the clinicians together decide to place a G-tube prior to nursing home transfer. Common case? So about what percent of patients would say that they would be very unwilling or would rather die than be permanently fed through a tube? Go ahead and vote. 100%? To 75%? 50%? 25%? Or no one would ever say that. So only 6% said that 100% that of patients would say that. 75% uh, said, uh, I'm sorry, 47% said about three quarters and 27% said about half the patients. Well actually, we asked this question to patients, next slide, and it turns out that more than half would say that they rather die. And another 25% are very unwilling. And very few patients, actually, would be willing to, fed, to be fed through a tube. And that makes it quite unlikely that when this decision is being made, it's the, it's the decision that this patient would have made if we could have talked to her. 
This isn't a failure of advanced care planning, and it's something that we, as primary care docs, have the ability to correct. It turns out that at the end of life, we tend to provide less than optimal care. Uh, these are jo data from Joan Tino, where she called the families of patients who died in the hospital and asked about the care received. And they reported that 50% of the families said that there was inadequate emotional support, 30% inadequate information about decisions being made at the end of life, and about a quarter said that there was inadequate physician communication, attention to pain, and attention to dyspnea. So even patients who are in the hospital toward the end of life don't receive all the care that we're able to actually provide and inadequate um, attention to decision making. These are newer data from Joan Tino, and what she shows is even over the past 10 years, actually she looked at 2000 versus 2009, the intensity of care for patients who die has, has increased. If you look at the top line, the amount of patients in hospice has actually increased from 22% up to 42%. But the percentage of those patients who were in hospice for a very short period of time, three days or less, increased from five to about 10%. And the percentage of patients in the hospital in the last month, in the last three months, went from 63 up to 69%. In the ICU, 24 up to 29%. And the number of transitions in the last three months of life is more than three for a median. So that means that most patients went from home to hospital to nursing home to hospital or something like that before they died. That there was inadequate planning beforehand for what demise might be like for these patients. And it's often because of cases like this. So a 71-year-old man with ischemic heart disease gradually develops his severe systolic failure uh, over four years. His EF is below 20% and he has no coronary lesions amenable to bypass or stent. His cardiologist has maximized his medical therapy, and now his renal function is worsening. So the primary care doc asks the man to complete a five wishes. How many of you have, have uh, used a five wishes form? Oh, a few hands, that's great. Um, the, man, the man never brings it back, which is actually my experience with five wishes forms in most cases. I'm gonna show it to you in a moment. And he subsequently presents in an emergency room with pneumonia and pulmonary edema. A week later, he's intubated in the ICU in multiple organ system failure. A not atypical situation with a primary care doc who recognized that the end of life was coming and tried to intervene, but it was not effective. And there's a lot of obstacles to advanced care planning. There's never enough time. There's always other pressing issues. It's an uncomfortable conversation, and it takes time to actually carry it out for the patient and family, but also for us. It's often considered to be someone else's responsibility. I think that the oncologist knows the prognosis better than I do. Why isn't he having this conversation with the patient? And it's never the right time, right? When the patient is unstable in the hospital, that would be a perfect teachable moment to bring it up. But the hospitalist says, gee, I don't know this guy all that well. When he's back with his primary care doc, that's the good time to have this conversation. And we know, because we have talked and we have, we have surveyed patients and docs about what they want. And this is a study that's now quite old but has never been replicated, where patients that had a 50% chance of six-month mortality in the hospital were interviewed. And they asked the patient, and I do not recommend ever asking patients this if, unless you need to, would you want to be resuscitated? And the patients, in general, most of them, said that they would want to be resuscitated. That's these two cells right here. However, a substantial number of these patients, these two cells, said no, I wouldn't want to. I've decided I wouldn't want to be resuscitated. Within a day, the researchers went to the doctors and asked them, what would your patient say if we asked him or her if he wanted to be resuscitated? And the docs said, you can't ask that kind of a question. And the researcher said, well, we did yesterday, and we know what they said. What would you say that your patient would say? And it turns out among the group where the patient said, I prefer not to be resuscitated, the docs were a little bit worse than 50-50. 
right? 990 of the docs said my patient would, would want to be resuscitated. Does this matter? So these patients, just the ones who said DNR, were followed. And it turns out that the 827 were the docs knew the patient's preference not to be resuscitated. 653 of them, 79%, had a DNR order on the chart, usually within three days. Eight of them got resuscitated. We actually pulled all those charts. One of them survived the resuscitation for one day in the ICU and died. All eight died. Of the 990 patients where the doctors didn't know the patient said, I prefer not, only 38% of them had DNR orders, and that translated into 42 of those patients, or 4% of them, getting resuscitated. They spent, in, among all of the group, more than 120 days in the ICU. One person left the hospital for one day on hospice and died. This is a quality of care issue. If we don't know what our patients' preferences are, then they often will receive care that is not only inconsistent with their prognosis, as we see here, patients who got resuscitated didn't survive, but also inconsistent with their preferences. Now, if I say, let's not ask about resuscitation, how do we get to that point? We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. But first, let me ask you, in deciding about resuscitation, patients often focus on whether they'll be functional after CPR. If a patient receives CPR in the hospital, is function more likely to be preserved if the patient requires CPR soon after admission or later in the hospitalization? You can vote. One, post-CPR function is better if CPR occurs early. Two, post-CPR function is better if CPR occurs late. Or three, post-CPR function is always bad. Timing doesn't matter. What do you think? So over half of you thought that your function is better uh, if the CPR is required uh, early. Um, and 36% uh, of you have a rather bleak uh, view of the, of the success of CPR. Um, next slide. Um, you're right in general. Whoops, slide after this. That these are the odds of functional preservation after resuscitation in the hospital. It turns out it's considerably worse if you're older. You have five times the odds, I'm sorry, of function deteriorating after CPR if you're 75 or older. But the most important variable is when it occurs. Eight times the odds of having uh, worsened function uh, if, in fact, CPR occurs after day three. And this wasn't just a little bit of worsened function. The median decrement in ADLs was five. So most of these patients walked into the hospital able to do everything and were transferred to a nursing home, probably able to feed themselves, and that's all and maybe not even that. So for our older patients, we have about three days to figure out what their preferences are in order to know whether they ought to receive things like resuscitation in the hospital. And it turns out that we don't provide great end-of-life care because we don't do great end-of-life planning in hospitals. Now this is, these are actually UCLA data. We looked at an entire year of uh, deaths in the hospital. And then we looked at whether defibrillators were turned off for, for patients expected to die, and whether patients participated in decision making uh, concerning life sustaining treatments, and whether goals of care conversations occurred for patients in the hospital. And it turns out that these things occurred about 50% of the time or less. Um, now, these data are now a few years old. And we have interventions currently going on to improve this circumstance. But the fact is, is that others who have looked at similar, um, at similar measures find that, that discussions of this sort rarely occur before the events that occur in the hospital. And in fact, you might expect that for patients who, who are considered for or receiving transplants, there would be more people around to have such conversations. But in fact, the data are a little bit worse 
that calls of care conversations are much more likely to occur, 39% versus 20% for patients who aren't considered for transplants versus those considered. And when death is expected, if you are considered for a transplant, you're half as likely to have a fully comfort-oriented plan of care. This is not for people who die all of a sudden. These are for patients who are expected to die. Our ability to maneuver, to, stop, to, to change from going full bore to save a life toward comfort-oriented care is quite limited. Therefore, we as primary care docs especially, especially for the continuity, have the ability to carry out advanced care planning. What is advanced care planning? It's the conversations about prognosis and possible treatment options that will lead to the kinds of care that patients subsequently receive. And in theory, patients have the right to direct their care within the goals of medicine, as I spoke about before. There are some limits on that. Um, and we as docs have a beneficent responsibility to tailor care to a patient's clinical circumstances and preferences. And I put in italics there in steward resources because I think we're the ones who can do that appropriately. And this likely requires specification of a surrogate and a prospective discussion about goals of care, often with appropriate documentation. Um, in practice, this means the right conversation at the right time. Um, it means identifying who the appropriate surrogate is and using the tools. But the most important thing is to initiate this advanced care planning. And in my experience, even if the patient stops you before you get very far, just the fact that you began talking about this topic is not forgotten. And when prognosis changes, they'll know that you're open to this. And in fact, it's easier to come back to at a subsequent time. So this is a, this is a patient of mine. An 82-year-old generally healthy uh, man presents as a new patient. Um, he has hypertension, osteoarthritis, and uh, he's there for a, a new exam. During the history, I find out this patient has no family and no friends. Uh, I asked him, what do you do all day? He says, you know, I go to the senior center and I play cards. I said, oh, how about the guys at the senior center? Don't know them. Okay, that's what you do, but you don't know the guys. So who would make medical decisions for you if you can't make them for yourself? He says, oh, my landlord. He knows exactly what I want. Okay. Now, I promise I wouldn't have known to call the guy's landlord. So what sort of documentation should be completed for this patient uh, in order to establish who should make decisions for him? One, a durable power of attorney for health care. Two, a five wishes. Three, no documentation, just write it in your note. Or four, a financial power of attorney. Still got that fire burning hot like never before. Still got my heart beating loud like four on the floor. Bottles popping, fists pumping, and I'm ready for more. That's right. 71% of you are absolutely correct. What he needs is a durable power of attorney for health care in Nevada or in California or actually in any of the United States. Next slide. We ought to be identifying surrogate decision makers for every patient who has a possibility that they're not going to be able to make their own decisions. And that means usually older patients, but not just older patients. Patients that don't have family or for whom the family members are likely to lack decision-making capacity or that there's likely to be disagreements among the potential surrogates or between the surrogates and what patients would want. We can identify these cases pretty easily. In fact, I bet right now if you run through your patient list, you can think of 25, 50, 100 people that would fit in these categories. And I wonder whether every one of them has a durable power of attorney for health care um, identifying an appropriate surrogate. Uh, this is one example. This is from the California Hospital Association. Nevada similarly has a document like this. Actually, there are plenty of advanced directive documents. It really doesn't matter which one you choose to use. I actually particularly like the California Easy Reading uh, Advanced Directive. And one can Google that and easily find it. And you can print it off and use it to your heart's content. And patients tend to understand it, fill it out, and bring them back. Five wishes is worth knowing about. And I'm particularly interested in the people that already use it, uh, how they use it. 
This is a document that helps patients and families work through what their values are. If you have a family or a patient that's really struggling with what the right course is, and they're willing to sit down and work, perhaps with you, but even among themselves for an hour, this document will help lead them through. What are this patient's values? What do they prefer? What are they willing to trade off? What kinds of decisions do they want made at the end of life? I have found this to be an extremely valuable document for the right patient and the right family that wants to really dedicate themselves to thinking about future medical care. The rest of the time, it's a buck fifty, which these cost, down the drain, because they don't get used and they don't come back. So I have a small stack of them in my office, and I probably use one every two to three weeks. Not commonly, but extremely valuable for the right family and the right patient. And I would, per, I would put forward that we ought to be having these conversations for every patient who's likely to have a high-risk procedure or get into a situation where there is an adverse health state. And this tiny study uh, teaches me a lot. This is a small study done in Wisconsin. These are patients who went in for uh, elective bypass and valve surgery on the pump and they randomized them to an advanced care planning conversation where they talked about adverse events on the pump versus usual care, which means no conversation. And they then went and asked about the, their knowledge, the congruence between the surrogate and the patient, decisional conflict, and most importantly, anxiety, pre-op and post-op. And it turns out that knowledge was about the same, Congruence was slightly better with advanced care planning. Conflict was slightly lower. But most importantly, you can talk about this in a, with a patient who's about to go in for a cardiac surgery without increasing anxiety, without having adverse effects. These conversations really can occur. And in fact, we just hired a, an advanced care planning social worker that's going to have a conversation like this with every one of our patients that are coming in for advanced cardiac mechanical devices because this is doable. So case five, a 78-year-old man has advanced heart failure and several comorbidities. During the hospitalization, you discuss prognosis with the patient and his son, and together you decide that he does not want to be rehospitalized if possible and certainly doesn't want CPR or ICU care. He'll go to a skilled facility for rehab before returning home. So. What's the appropriate advanced care planning document for this patient? One, an advanced directive, and you check the way burdens versus benefits box. Two, a pulse. Or three, you don't need a document. Go ahead and vote. You ain't nothing but a dog. Pretty good, 48% of you said pulsed, and 48% wanted to use an advanced directive. You could use an advanced directive for this purpose, but the right tool for this purpose is a pulsed. Next slide. Uh, I don't know how many of you are from Nevada, but this is a Nevada pulsed. I couldn't get a picture that was pink, but it is pink in Nevada. Um, anyone from Nevada used a pulsed document like this? A few hands. And this is the back of the same document. Um, those of you from California might recognize this. This is the California version. Um, what is a POLST? A POLST is an amazing tool. It allows the work that you did with this patient, that conversation that you had that gets translated into an order, say a DNR order, or an order not to put, place a feeding tube, or an order concerning intensity of treatment, that order that you write in the hospital goes onto the pulse and gets transferred with the patient to a skilled facility, a rehab unit, or even home, and the order stands. So I have no privileges in that skilled facility, but because I completed the pulse and it went with the patient, my order stands at that nursing home or at that rehab unit. And in fact, we're beginning to see that the advanced care planning that occurs in the hospital gets translated into all the different venues of care if a pulse is completed. 
So I would say that any patient who wants less than fully aggressive care, who's being transferred out of the hospital to another place, another hospital, a, a, a skilled facility, other facilities, ought to, be, ought to have a pulsed form. And they're available in most states now, well, at least two-thirds of the states, but both Nevada and California. And in fact, respecting choices is a mechanism of doing advanced care planning that is community-wide in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And what they showed is that they're able to actually get to the point where 85% of eligible patients had completed an advanced directive, and virtually all deaths, the, re the treatments received matched the preferences that the patients had. And it turns out that utilization is far lower in La Crosse, Wisconsin, than it is in most other cities in the United States. Now, that's nothing like the cities that we live in. It tends to be homogeneous, and it's in the Midwest. But the fact is, is that it shows that we're, it is possible to promulgate advanced care planning across a large population of patients, and the care that those patients will receive can match what the patients want. So how does one have this conversation? Well, I want to argue that we are in the perfect position to be able to take into account the patient's clinical circumstances, prognosis, and quality of life, and understand what their treatment options are and help integrate their values into the care that they receive. Take a patient of mine, a young woman with breast cancer in her 30s. She received every available treatment, and every treatment we gave to her failed. And within three years, she has widely metastatic disease. During that time that she received chemo and XRT and surgeries, she was very careful to make sure that her care didn't get in the way of caring for her two young kids. I think there were like five and nine. She did everything she could to be on the soccer field, to be in the office, to, to be in their classroom. All she cared about is taking care of those two kids and being there for them. So when the oncologist called me and said, wow, you got to see the CT I got, it's all tumor. Why don't you call her in and talk to her? The first thing I said is, why don't I call her in and talk to her? What? You got the CT, right? <laughs> But I called her and I said, I want you to come in and I want you to bring your husband. We have to talk. And she knew exactly what that meant. Never had I asked her to bring her husband to an appointment. And I showed her the CT and we talked about the fact that she is likely to die very soon and she's probably gonna die a respiratory death and she'll get pneumonia and we'll treat her as aggressively as we can and she might get better, but if she doesn't, then her choice will be to die in an ICU or to die comfortably outside of an ICU with her family around. And I believe that she wants the latter. She wouldn't want us to resuscitate her. She wouldn't want to be on a ventilator and that we shouldn't do that. And there was a lot of unhappiness and a lot of crying. And she agreed that that's the plan of care that she would want. And in fact, it was only a few weeks later, she gets in, she's at the ER with pneumonia. We treat her, she's getting better in the hospital, but then starts getting worse. At two o'clock in the morning, she's to Kipnik to 40. And the intern comes to see her and says, you're really suffering. It's time for the morphine to start. I'm gonna call your family in because I know that that's what you would want. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And she died around noon the following day. This only can happen because of an advanced care planning conversation with a doc who has continuity with a patient who has followed her and is able to integrate the values into the treatment options and communicate to be able to outline this end of life treatment plan. We're the ones who have the capability to do this. The consultant often can't and usually won't. And it also preserves autonomy. She could have said to me, wow, you're my doc? That's what you think I want? I want the 0.01% chance that I'll get out of that unit off that ventilator. You're 100% wrong. My goal was not to override her autonomy. 
It was to place her prognosis and her possible treatment options into the context of her values and to lay out that end-of-life treatment plan. And in fact, with every patient that I have who has advancing illness, this is what I try to accomplish using these tools of advanced directives and pulses and whatever else we need. It turns out that at UCLA we have a goals of care note tab where I can write down the notes about these conversations and others can then see what's happened thus far and then go ahead and build on top of them. I'm gonna actually speed up through K6 and just talk about medical futility for a moment. Medical futility is what we often run into when we either don't have good end of life conversations or under circumstances that are out of our control. And Larry Schneiderman, down at UCSD, describes it really brilliantly. He says that medical futility is the unacceptable likelihood of achieving an effect that the patient has the capacity to appreciate as a benefit. Now, I had to read this six times before I understood it. But medical futility is the unacceptable likelihood of achieving an effect that the patient has the capacity to appreciate as a benefit. We can't achieve an effect that the patient is going to be able to appreciate as a benefit. That's how he defines medical futility. We studied patients in our intensive care units and asked the docs every day as they started to work, are you going to provide medically futile treatment to any of your ICU patients today? Now, it's sort of hard to believe that a doc would say yes, but it turns out that for 904 patients, they didn't, but for 98, they said, I'm gonna provide probably futile treatment, and for 123, they said, yes, I'm doing that today. And it turns out that there were um, uh, overall 464 days of futile treatment provided uh, in our ICUs uh, over a three-month period. And when we asked, what, what's happening with these patients that you're providing uh, the, the, this sort of futile treatment? They can't benefit the patient in a way that will be meaningful to them. It turns out that for 71 of them, the burdens grossly outweighed the benefits. For another 44, they said the patient will never be able to survive outside of an ICU. For 37 patients, they're permanently unconscious. 63, the treatment can't achieve the patient's goal. For 45, death was imminent. One, the patient was terminally non-adherent, which is a really interesting case. And for 32 of them, there was futile treatment on the day that the patient transitioned to palliative care. So I'm not gonna go into great detail about this except to show you that those patients that the doctors said were receiving futile treatment, 68% of them died in the hospital, 80, 85% di uh, died within six months, and it turns out that the ones that didn't die were mostly comatose on life-sustaining treatments in LTACs or skilled nursing facilities. This has implications beyond those few patients. It has an opportunity cost, and we actually studied this. We looked at waiting time in the ER and waiting time for patients trying to transfer into our ICUs when there was a, futile, a patient receiving futile treatment in the ICU and the ICU was full. And it turns out the numbers are not large, but I'm going to skip to, to ahead. The numbers are not large, but it turns out that there were 37 patients who uh, never made a transfer, and there were another 22 patients um, who got delayed at least a day with a patient in a full ICU that the doctor said where that there's at least another patient in this ICU that's receiving treatment that I should not be providing. When we have explored deeper into these cases, these were usually cases where advanced care planning could have occurred at a much earlier time. Cases not unlike the woman with the aspiration pneumonia that got the G-tube, but the opportunity to talk to her 
about her preferences were missed. There is a power, powerful motivation to rescue. And Al Johnson, who's a quite good ethicist, said, our moral response to the imminence of death demands that we rescue the doomed. We throw a rope to the drowning. We rush into burning buildings to snatch the entrapped. We dispatch teams to search for the snowbound. This rescue morality spills into medical care where our ropes are artificial hearts. Should the rule of rescue set a limit to the rational calculation of the efficacy of technology? And I think I'm here to say no that we can rethink cases like this, the, the patient who was brought in um, to receive the heart transplant and then is on the left ventricular assist device. Um, most of you voted to either go to court or have some other response, which afterwards I'm gonna stick around so I can hear those. Um, but we can consider the indication for this left, left ventricular assist device. There may be a professional responsibility to actually stop this device within the goals of medicine if it's not achieving something that this patient can benefit from. And we ought to have a plan for stopping the device that ought to be part of the consent form for starting it. And that gets us back to advanced care planning, which is what I'm here to talk about today. So, he throws the first dart, he gets a bullseye. The second dart is a bullseye. The third dart is another bullseye. Now this is a dartboard that I can love. This is the way that we handle end of life care. When, when we provide care at the end of life that doesn't, doesn't match preferences and doesn't match prognosis, and we know that we could have talked about these things a year earlier, two years earlier, there's never criticism of it. But the fact is that we can do much better that no longer is, is end-of-life planning something that ought to be an afterthought. In fact, it ought to be one of the central things that we as primary care docs do. And hopefully now you have the tools to be able to carry it out. Thanks. Can, can I take questions? Yeah. Right, so, so the question is, you have a pulsed form, and it goes, it goes to a rehab facility. Is it really in order, or does the attending in the rehab facility have to you know, talk to the patient and make sure it's valid? So a best practice is for the attending in the, in the rehab or the SNF to make sure that the pulsed matches what the patient or the family believes the patient wants, but actually it stands as an order until it's revoked. So it is, it is an order whether the attending does it or not. Yeah, question. Um, about the post form, my experience is that it's always good to keep a copy for yourself because when the patients are being transferred from the hospital to the facility, they don't pass it along and it gets lost eventually and then nobody knows where it is. Yeah. I, I fully agree with that. I always make a copy, and in fact, we scan it into a special place on our electronic record where you can always find it. But I always keep a pot copy of a pulse. Question. Yeah, in Oregon, we have what we call the Oregon Ethics Committee that we submit. When we do the pulse form, that we submit automatically to the Ethics Committee. Right. And so if the ER would like to know what the patient wants, they just access into the central. Right. So those, those in Oregon, there's a registry for all post forms. And those post forms, the registry also uh, uh, serves as a quality control because a post form needs to be signed by the patient and the physician, actually in Oregon, an, an NP can also sign it. Um, and then the pulse is available for a firefighter who needs to call in, an emergency room, another doc. You can always find out where it is. California is trying to build a registry. I think one other state is as well. Any other questions? Well, thank you. <laughs>